accessibility. Accessibility is a fundamental principle that shapes the way we design and deliver educational materials. Um, accessibility ensures that every student, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, can access, engage, and benefit from the content we provide. So in simple terms, accessibility is the key to unlocking education for all. Um, accessibility creates an inclusive environment where everyone has an equal opportunity to participate and succeed. So before I, uh, we get started, I just want to briefly mention uh, some of the different disabilities that exist. These can include visual impairments, hearing impairments, motor disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and more. Uh, each of these present their, their unique challenges, but it is our role working with higher education to create an, uh, an environment where everyone is accommodated and supports are needed, are, are met. So uh, moving on to the law and what you see here, these are applicable federal mandates. So we have section 504 and 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and WCAG 2.3. Um, so for starting with section 504, um, this makes sure that students with disabilities get the same chances and benefits as everyone else. Um, and also section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, so digital services must be made accessible. This includes not only websites themselves, but any documents uploaded or shared online as well. And then we have the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, this ensures that individuals with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. And at the bottom here, you'll see WCAG 2.3. Now, WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, the 2.3 just, uh, it stands for the version we're at right now. Now, WCAG isn't a law itself. It's more of a set of guidelines and standards to help make content more accessible. And WCAG has four main principles that fall under the acronym POUR, P-O-U-R. So this acronym stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, and it essentially represents the four essential principles of digital accessibility to ensure that digital content is perceivable, is operable, is understandable, and is robust. So perceivable, um, this principle focuses on making information and user interface components easily perceptible to all users, regardless of their ability or disability. Um, an example of this is providing alternate text to images or providing captions to video content. Um, next up, we have operable. So this principle ensures that users can interact with and navigate a digital product. Um, a key consideration is keyboard accessibility, ensuring that those who can't use a mouse can navigate with a keyboard. Um, next up is understandable. Now this principle focuses on making content clear and straightforward. Um, it aims to ensure that all users can comprehend and use the information provided. Um, so this includes using clear and simple language, large enough font size, consistent navigation structure, etc. And next up is robust. So this principle emphasizes creating content that can um, reliably be interpreted by a wide variety of users, and this includes um, users who use assistive technologies. Universal design. You may also know it as inclusive design. 
This is a methodology for creating products and environments to be accessible to all people, regardless of their sex, age, disability, or other factors. It's about creating accessibility, inclusivity from the ground up. So you ensure that the design caters to the needs of the widest possible audience. So I want you to think, uh, to, to put disabilities aside for one moment and consider other options of accessing content. So for instance, imagine there's a student who, has, who doesn't have any hearing impairment, but they find themselves in a library where they have to maintain silence. So in this scenario, they wouldn't be able to just put on their speakers. So listening to an audio recording or a video, um, they would need some other options. So a caption here would become very helpful. Having captions available would not only help those with hearing impairments, but also help other individuals with temporary specific situations. Uh, so this pretty much uh, shows us the beauty of universal design. It benefits everyone. It's about creating an environment where all students, regardless of their circumstances, can access, engage, and all their content seamlessly. Next slide, please. So as we get into the practical aspects of creating accessible digital content, it's crucial to keep in mind that accessibility should not be an afterthought or a box to check after the document is complete. Instead, it should be an integral part of the creation process. Uh, just keep in mind that these tips and tricks uh, we're about to discuss are not just meant for specific platforms or situations, uh, whether you're sharing your content through email, presenting it in class, or using platforms like Blackboard or the upcoming Brightspace, these principles usually uh, apply universally to all documents and online content. Uh, so just keep in mind that you would want to create a consistent and accessible experience through all, all digital channels. So now to explore some of these strategies, we will start with color and contrast. Uh, the way we use color in our digital content can significantly impact how information is perceived, uh, particularly to those individuals who have low vision or color blindness, uh, as they may struggle to distinguish between certain color combinations. Uh, insufficient color contrast can make text, charts, graphics, uh, other content difficult to read, and that can impact overall the user experience. So giving an adequate color contrast uh, ensures that all the content is legible and comprehensible. Uh, I just want to keep uh, uh, make a note. Uh, it's also important to not rely on color to convey information. So for example, you don't want to say, uh, click this blue arrow or, or look at the highlighted blue or red text. Um, so you would wanna try to use labels or patterns to, to give this information and just make sure that your content is understandable without color perception. Next slide. Uh, here we have a tool from WebAIM uh, it is an online color contrast checker. So this checker will tell you if the color contrast meets the WCAG accessibility uh, standards. So ideally, uh, you would want to meet the WCAG AA standard. This sets a good base standard for, for accessibility, while the AAA goes an extra mile to make things cle even more clear and uh, more accessible to even more people. Um, so you would just choose the colors, uh, the foreground and then the background color, and it would give you the contrast and it tells you if it passes or not the double A or the triple A standard. We will give you a list of some resources at the end uh, so you can check these tools out yourselves. As for fonts, you would want to avoid decorated fonts as is shown on screen. Uh, 
They may look appealing, but can result challenging for some individuals to read. I, it's recommended to stick to sans serif fonts like Arial, Helvetica, Verdana, Calibri that have a more clean, straightforward style. As for sizes, uh, you want to ensure that the text is large enough to be easily read. A recommended font size is about 14 to 16 pixels for body text. And you want to make sure that uh, this text size is also scalable. Uh, so you want to make sure it's still legible if it's zoomed in um, or out. It's crucial for, for individuals uh, for visual impairments that may need to enlarge their text. And you can also uh, keep in mind the line spacing, uh, providing enough space uh, between lines helps to avoid uh, the text being crowded up in, in sections and improves the overall readability. For tables, uh, you want to keep the layouts in a simple and consistent matter. Uh, you want to avoid complex structures that may be challenging for assistive technologies like screen readers to interpret. You should always keep in mind to use your header rows and columns to give a structure and give a, a clear indication of what you're reading in the table. Uh, you would preferably uh, not use merged cells and avoid blank cells as these can create issues for screen readers to read. And if ever needed, uh, as shown on screen, you may want to separate or break down uh, complex tables into two or more tables. And on the contrary, if you consider that a table isn't explicitly needed to portray certain information, I would suggest you just consider using text to avoid potential accessibility issues. For charts and graphs, you would also want to keep a clear and simple design. Always provide alternative text for the charts and graphs, uh, describing the key information that it shows. Uh, screen readers can either uh, just give off uh, the alternative text, or if it's able to, to read out uh, the contents of the graphs, then that would be of help also. Uh, make sure you always also use your labels and legends uh, to provide context of what is being read in, th in these graphics. Um, it is also helpful to use high contrast borders for these graphics. Uh, it will help uh, differentiate between different data points. Um, and you should always uh, accompany the charts and graphs with text descriptions that summarize some of the main points. For the next slide, we have some links. Uh, so screen readers uh, specifically will read out each character uh, that's on screen. So reading a li this link would be very long and, and confusing. Um, so you would want to always use a descriptive link text. Uh, just always indicate uh, the exact destination or the purpose of the link. And you should avoid generic terms like click here or read more as they will not indicate through screen readers of where the link is taking you. For alternate text, uh, uh, this is a brief description of, of what the image is showing. It serves as a textual alternative for users uh, with visual impairments uh, to know what is being shown. Um, you would want to use concise descriptive words. Uh, try to keep it preferably under two sentences. You don't want this to be too long. And uh, here in, in the image, we see you can also mark images as decorative. These don't, don't really need to be uh, described. Uh, 
that's more for like um it could be for borders or just something that does not show any type of information and for accessibility checkers uh these are tools that ensure that the digital content uh, meets certain standards of accessibility. Uh, however, it's important to note that they don't check everything. They can catch many issues, uh, but they will not guarantee full compliance with accessibility guidelines. Some aspects do require manual evaluation and um, uh, sometimes these checkers will generate uh, warnings that uh, you do need some someone to to check and actually go through, uh, and 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 from there take uh, your remediation. Um, just just that is important to just keep in mind. You always have to go through it again and and revise yourself just to make sure you're not leaving anything out. Back to you, Tanya. Uh, she's going to explain some more about the different accessibility checkers that we have. Thank you, Melissa. So uh, what she went over, uh, the principles that she discussed apply across all digital mediums, digital documents, and online content. Um, however, when it comes to Microsoft documents and PDF documents, there are some more um, accessibility tips that are more specific um, to those documents. Um, and I'm just gonna be going over those. First, starting with Microsoft accessibility, and this will include uh, particularly heading styles, lists, and the built-in accessibility checker in Microsoft products. And again, this applies to all Microsoft documents. Um, so first, starting off with heading styles, even though this is more particular to Microsoft Word documents. Um, so heading styles are used to create headings and subheadings to indicate different levels of hierarchy in your content. So we want to use the, the built-in heading styles formatting, not just, we don't just want to make them visually look like heading styles. We actually want to use the formatting. And this gives Word documents logical structure for navigation. And what I mean by navigation is screen reading navigation. So screen readers read out loud these headings and it helps users understand the organization of the content. It also ensures a uniform and predictable document structure, which makes it more accessible for all users. Um, a tip for using heading styles is to go in order. Um, don't skip headings. For example, let's say you have a, a document where you need to use multiple headings. Um, don't go from heading one to heading three. Uh, go in order from heading style one to heading style two, heading three, so on and so forth. And moving on to lists, if you are using lists in your document, again, we want to make sure that we're using the built-in list formatting. We want to avoid using dashes or any other keyboard symbols to, to make a list or to just visually make it look like a list. Um, we want to use the built-in bulleting styles or number styles. Um, if you have nested items, we want to make sure that we use the tab key on, on the keyboard to properly indent these items within the list. And we want to avoid using the space bar when indenting. So we always wanna use the tab key for indentation. And again, this ensures that the lists are accurately conveyed by screen readers. Screen readers do detect lists out loud and it, it, it lets the user know when it comes across a list. Now, something that's some tips that are specific to PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint documents. Um, we want to use an accessible theme, keeping color contrast and font size in mind. 
Um, we want to ensure high contrast between the text and background colors. We also want to use consistent design elements in the PowerPoint theme, uh, theme meaning consistent color, fonts, and styles throughout the presentation. We also want to avoid large amount of text in each slide. Either way, I think we all should avoid putting uh, avoid putting large amounts of text in PowerPoint slides. You know, that's not the purpose of PowerPoint. I feel like that's it's PowerPoint etiquette, right? For lack of better words. Um, either way, we want to avoid information overload. Um, this can be distracting and even difficult to understand by individuals with certain disabilities. We also want to avoid complex transitions or any flashy animations. Um, this again, this can be distracting and even disorienting to some to some individuals. <clears throat> we also want to ensure that each slide, each PowerPoint slide has a unique title. Again, this is for screen reading purposes. That way, when a screen reader comes across two slides or when a screen reader comes across a, um, two slides with the same title, that can that can be confusing. So each slide should have its own unique title. And we want to make sure that each slide is in the correct logical reading order for screen reading purposes. Now, the main purpose of PowerPoint, right, is to visually display content to people, right? However, if you need to share a PowerPoint with folks, uh, in my opinion, it's the best way is to export the PowerPoint as a PDF document and share it that way. Um, when it comes to reading a PowerPoint document with a screen reader, it can get a bit complicated. Of course, it depends on the elements in the document and how, compli how complicated it was made. Um, but when you export as a PDF document, even if there are just like simple transition element transitions or slide transitions in the PowerPoint, um, when you export as a PDF, it, it removes all of that. So it just makes it easier to read with a, a screen reader. So uh, all Microsoft documents come with a built-in accessibility checker. Um, it lets you know if there's missing alternate text, um, if you have tables, if there are no header rows or column rows uh, depicted in the tables, it will let you know. If there are any blank characters, it will let you know. Um, that's another thing we want to avoid in Microsoft Word documents. We want to avoid um, unnecessary blank spaces. Um, previously, I mentioned that we want when we're indenting, not just for lists, but in general in Microsoft documents, we want to avoid constantly pressing the space bar five or 10 times to indent. Um, this avoids blank characters. So we want to use the tab key um, instead of just the space bar. Um, if we right click on any of these, on any errors in Microsoft Word's accessibility checker, um, it will even give you um, instructions on how to remediate that error. And of course, you know, it's, it's never enough to just use the accessibility checker. It's always a good idea to manually review the document um, to ensure accessibility. So moving on to some um, tips that are more specific to PDF document accessibility. Um, I'll be going over Adobe Acrobat Pro, uh, metadata document structure, and Adobe Acrobat's Access, um, accessibility checker. So first is Adobe Acrobat Pro. So in order to remediate a PDF document or to make a PDF document accessible, you will need Adobe Acrobat Pro. Most folks have the free Adobe Reader, but Adobe Reader is different than Acrobat Pro. Um, Reader does not have the built-in accessibility tools that Adobe Acrobat Pro has. Um, if you don't have access to Adobe Acrobat Pro, 
I believe, I know, I know each campus is different, but for the most part, you can contact your IT department and take it from there. Now going on to uh, PDF document structure. So this image on the left shows gray boxes in numerical order. And these gray boxes are surrounding each element in the document. So these are tags that provide logical reading order to a PDF document. And when we say logical reading order, uh, I mean reading order for screen, screen readers. Um, so these tags provide structural, structural information about the document's content. And screen readers interpret these tags and they read them out loud. So each element needs to have a tag and we tag the elements depending on their type. So for example, headings will have the heading tag. Um, regular text will have the paragraph tag. Images will have the figure tags, so on and so forth. And um, on the right, it just shows um, a box where we input the metadata. So metadata just refers to additional information that's embedded within the PDF document. And that just provides details about the document itself. So as you can see here, uh, metadata includes uh, document properties such as title, um, author, subject. Um, the most important part of this metadata would probably be the title. If you go through Adobe's accessibility checker, it will notify you if you have a title or not. So moving on to PDF's accessibility checker. Now this looks a little bit different than Microsoft Word's accessibility checker. It shows you any issues, errors, and warnings and some warnings might let you know that it needs just a manual check, for example, color contrast. Um, for some errors, you can right click and then select fix. Now, when working with PDF documents, um, sometimes I know I've come across this when a document has um, all the necessary tags and you run it through the, the accessibility checker, it will still show tagged PDF failed. Um, it, that just happens sometimes, even though you did add the correct tags. And um, But what you can do is you can right click and then just select fix, and then that error will go away. Um, for some warnings, again, such as the color contrast warning, or even the logical reading order warning, this just, they both just say that they need a manual check. So once you manually go through all the docu the entire document, um, you can right click on the warning and just select pass. And then moving on to audio and video content. So I will be discussing captions and captions not only apply to video content, but to any audio files as well. So if you're providing videos or again, audio files, um, it's best to provide either closed or open captions um, or at least transcriptions of the content. You might hear the term closed captions pretty often. Um, closed captions just means that captions can be toggled on or off. And open captions means that the captions are embedded into the video. So open captions will always show, you can't toggle them off. Um, um, I've gotten this question before, uh, what if my video has subtitles, is that sufficient? Um, subtitles cannot take the place of captions because subtitles only provide the translation of what's being said, right? So captions actually depict not only what's being said, but also other elements in the video or audio. For example, any relevant sound effects, uh, such as applause or any other re relevant sounds. Um, 
and not only that, but if there, if there is more than one speaker in a video, um, they have to be identified as such in captions. Another thing I want to mention is uh, YouTube's automatic captioning feature. If you are uploading your own videos onto YouTube, you can utilize YouTube's uh, automatic captioning. Um, however, just applying automatic captions is not enough for the most part. You will need to go back and make any appropriate edits and that's all done within YouTube. Um, a lot of times the automatic captions will come with errors and the automatic captions may not capture all relevant elements such as sounds or various speakers um, in the video that do need to be captioned. Um, we do have a captioning software. Um, it's called Movie Captioner and we have the software for all faculty and staff to use. However, one thing to keep in mind is that captioning is a long and tedious process, especially for videos that are 20, 30 minutes or longer. Um, a five minute video can take up to 30 minutes of manually captioning. Um, I always recommend using um, automatic captions first and then edit from there. Um, that can be, that will cut down the, the time drastically. Um, and before we move on to our last slide, I just want to say one thing to keep in mind is that not all documents are the same in terms of remediation. As Melissa mentioned, it's always best to keep, in, um, to keep accessibility in mind right from the start. Um, however, that might not always be the case, right? Um, if you're a faculty, if you're a professor, you may use a document that you haven't created, right? And some documents are more complicated than others. Um, some might be an easy five, 10 minute remediation and others might be so complex and complicated where it might take a lot longer than just 10 minutes. Um, and one thing I want to note is that Adobe Acrobat Pro is known to be a bit difficult to use when it comes to more complex documents. Um, it can be glitchy. I've come across glitches before with Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, especially when attempting to remediate PDF documents uh, where we don't know where its original source is from. Um, I've come across issues and glitches with documents where we have no idea where it was created from and um, it came with a bunch of complications. Um, this is why I always recommend if you're going to be making documents from scratch and you want to um, have the final document as a PDF, I recommend starting with Microsoft Word, making it accessible there, and then exporting it as a PDF. That way you avoid the complexities that come with Adobe Acrobat Pro. Um, of course, when, you're, when you make it accessible in Microsoft Word and when you export it as a PDF, um, I do want to say that the accessibility will retain, you know, again, however, that's not always the case. It's always a good idea to just manually go through it to ensure that it's still fully accessible. Um, and I see a question, where can we access Movie Captioner? Um, you can send me an email or I think I have your, if I don't have your email, yeah, you can send me an email. We can provide you with the serial number and the installation file to install it. And if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat or um, uh, you can come off mute to voice your questions as well. So these are just additional resources um, for everyone. So for starting on our CATS website, cats.cuny.edu, we do have step-by-step -step training videos 
um, for PDF documents, Microsoft documents, and these videos show you step-by-step -step on how to, for example, create an accessible table, how to add alternate text, um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I'm also linking W3C's website, um, and this goes more into detail on the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, again, I believe right now we're on version 2.3, and I believe this version is, um, I believe it's, it's they updated the guidelines to cover folks with um, disabilities that include seizures. I believe that's um, version 2.3. And also, um, there is a link, UDL on campus, that gives a lot more information on how to structure your classes using universal design in mind. And also, we have Web Ames Color Contrast Checker. I use this link. I have it bookmarked um, just to make sure that all my colors have sufficient color contrast. Also, Web Ames website also has a lot more um, instructions and information to to document accessibility as well. And so this is our emails. So if you, I see uh, in regards to movie captioner, you can send me an email here um, and I will send you over the information to, to install it. And if you have any questions or if, um, if there's any help that's needed to um, in regards to document remediation, we're here to help and you can contact us um, to help with any remediation concerns. Any questions? And again, this is being recorded. So um, once we stop the recording, um, we're going to have it captioned and then we're going to email it to everyone. I know some folks, or you may have some colleagues that wanted to join but weren't able to. Um, we can um, we can send, we can share it from there. Um, I see another question. Can you show the information about how to optimally Optimally show links again. You had used the B, the Blackboard login. Yes. Um, let me just, sorry, let me just go back. So in regards to links, let me just share my screen again. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if my share, let me share my screen once more. So um, you'll see here on the left, this is an example of a copy and pasted link. Of course, this is a bit of an exaggeration because uh, I, I believe this is Blackboard's login link. That's uh, what, one, two, three, four, five, six lines long. Um, some URLs aren't this long. However, we still want to avoid copy and pasted URLs. Um, and this is for screen reading purposes. Um, when a screen reader comes across a link, um, it will read all this jargon. And it's when it comes across this jargon, it, it gets confusing for screen reader users. It has no idea what the, or they have no idea what the link is or where it's taking them. Um, so where it says Blackboard login. So this is an example uh, um, of this URL um just as an accessible descriptive link so when a screen reader comes across for example this link that says blackboard login screen readers actually will say out loud link to indicate to the user that it comes it's come across a link so it will say link blackboard login so now they know where that uh, link is taking them um, there's also another example here that says click here um, Technically, this is not a copy and pasted link. However, this is still not accessible. And the reason for that is 
when it comes to screen readers, there is a specific key command to pull up all the links in a document. Now, let's say in the document, there's a whole bunch of links that say, click here, click here, click here, or read more, read more. Um, they have no idea where those links are taking them. Uh, therefore, just saying click here is not descriptive enough. Um, so something for like an example here, Blackboard login, users will know where it's taking them. Um, Facebook homepage, users will know where it's taking them. Um, it can also be, if you're linking to an article, it can be a title of an article. So things like that. Any other questions? All right, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this recording will be sent out shortly. Just keep an eye out. Um, I will try to get it back to everyone by today. I just have to see how long it's going to take to caption. Um, but if not by today, then early next week. And I will also be sharing our um, our PowerPoint that we that we shared today as well. Thank you everyone for joining us. And Margaret, I just saw your comment. Yes, you can share this with, with anyone. Thank you. Of course. Very helpful for, thank you a lot. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Hi, Helen, I just saw your, your question. Um, as of now, we won't be posting it publicly. Um, for now, um, it can be shared via email. I'll see if we can have it posted online. Um, but I'll I'll let everyone know if we if we go that route. Thank you, everyone.